Okay, we'll get started. First of all, uh, thank you all for your hard work on the first paper. Uh, as of an hour ago, uh, many, many of you had uploaded it, and uh, as of five minutes ago, I think almost everybody had. And uh, uh, so we will be meeting soon with the TFs to uh, discuss the uh, grading strategy and, and timeline on that. Um, but appreciate the hard work that you put in. If you have any uh, questions related to that paper, see us after class. Um, but it, so far, there have been no technical difficulties. Um, so I'm very happy today to have, a, I think, a transition in the course that the transition itself um, is being accomplished by a fellow at the Ethics Center who's worked on a very interesting set of issues last year, which I think sort of exemplify uh, a range of questions that you ha come to when you have actual on-the-ground case studies of institutional corruption. Uh, so Christine Baugh is a fellow at the Ethics Center here at Harvard. And she's also a research instructor in the Department of Neurology at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as a research coordinator at the Boston University Center for the Study of Traumatic Encephalopathy. She received her Master's of Public Health from Boston University School of Public Health in the Department of Health, Law, Bioethics, and Human Rights. Her research focuses on the long-term effects of concussions and repetitive head impacts, and she's authored several articles on these topics. Now, I should also note that Christine graduated cum laude from Harvard College with a Bachelor of Arts in History, Sci History and Science and a certificate from Harvard's Mind, Brain, and Behavioral Program. While at Harvard, Christine was a four-year varsity letter winner, uh, and in 2009-2010, she was captain of the women's rowing team, so she knows something about sports, uh, and she was also just sitting uh, where you all were a few years ago. Uh, and a great example of how you can take, uh, I think, a, a fantastic undergraduate education and turn it very quickly into very uh, real-world practical uh, research. So Christine today is going to talk about her work examining how revenues from football might impact the implementation of, the efficacy of, and attitudes towards concussion management plans at NCAA member schools. Uh, Professor Lessing and I both think this is an absolutely fascinating study to begin thinking about institutional corruption in practice. And we're very grateful, Christine, that you could be here today to lay it out for us. So you have the floor. Thanks, Bill. Um, if you ever need a, an ego boost, let Bill give you an introduction, <laughs> because that was a little bit overglowing. Thank you so much. Um, so I know that you guys all had a paper due today, which meant you did every single one of the readings. But just in case, uh, I laid everything out pretty clearly today. I really um, am hoping to engage, not just talk at you. So as we go along, uh, if you have any questions, let me know. But today, I really want to talk to you a little bit about concussions in sports, about the uh, NCAA, and about whether or not the NCAA might be an example of institutional corruption. So how we're going to do that is we're first going to talk about the NCAA and its institutional goals, why it was founded, what it was meant to do, what it's doing today. And then I'm going to sort of take a step back, tell you a little bit about what concussions are, why they matter, why they should matter to uh, collegiate athletes, and then see through this lens of concussions uh, whether the NCAA is fulfilling its institutional mission or whether maybe it's fallen into institutional corruption. Like I said, please ask questions. I can stand here and talk at you, but it's really not that exciting. Um, so if, you, if anything comes up along the way, a point you want to bring up, anything that is unclear, just shout out, raise your hand, do whatever you have to do. Um, so we'll start off first by talking about um, what the NCAA is, why it was founded. So a little bit of background. Um, the NCAA was actually founded under a different name in 1906. Um, it was founded to protect the health and well-being of student athletes. That was its main goal. And it was founded under the name the um, Intercollegiate Athletic Association of the United States. Now, why it was founded is actually a little bit interesting. In 1905, there were a lot of deaths, um, particularly from football. Um, athletes were uh, getting their skulls fractured, having bleeds on their brain. They were literally dying on the football field. And Pre Te President Teddy Roosevelt stepped in and said, if football doesn't change, I will ban it. Now, if you can imagine, that is a little bit different than what we might hear today. Football's a little bit bigger, uh, just a couple of billion dollars per year annually. Um, but it really was. That was the state of the game. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt met with the presidents of Harvard and Princeton and all of the Ivy Leagues. 
and they came up with a plan to make the game a little bit safer, and that was uh, the reason for the forming of the NCAA. Now, they instated some rules, they made some equipment changes, um, and in their own words, the NCAA was founded to protect young people from the dangerous and exploitative athletic practices of the time in 1906. The rugged nature of early day football typified by mass formations, gang tackling, uh, resulted in numerous injuries and death and prompted many college and universities to discontinue the sport. In many places, college football was run by student groups. So it was basically just a ragtag bunches of college men. They were just going out there, having a great time, but unfortunately dying because of their injuries. <laughs> and so something had to happen. Now, let's take a step back. The NCAA is founded to protect the health and well-being of student athletes. What does that actually mean? How could they actually do that? Like I said, they first began by making some rules for these games. That makes a lot of sense. We can think of rules about protective equipment. Today, more about the length of seasons, duration of seasons, ways that practices can happen. You can hear about ways coaches can communicate to recruit athletes, all kinds of things. Coming up with rules is one of the main ways the NCAA had and continues to attempt to protect the well-being of student athletes. So they instated helmets like these. This is actually from the Harvard Archive, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and they can also work to protect student athletes by enforcing rules. So it's not just about having the rules. It's about making sure that athletes and their institutions actually follow them. You'll come to understand that this is actually a really important part about rules. It's not just if they exist. It's whether people actually follow them that helps to protect or not protect the parties involved. So that's the basics of why the NCAA was founded. Institutional mission is pretty clear. It's meant to protect the health and well-being of athletes. So let's take a step back now, and we're going to talk a little bit about concussions, what they are, why they matter, short-term, long-term effects, and mostly why they should matter to the NCAA. So there's a lot of terms that I'm going to be talking about. Concussion, subconcussive blow, post-concussion syndrome, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. These sound like multisyllabic scientific words, and they are, but they also should matter because it's your brain we're talking about. And you don't just get concussions through sports. You can get them you know, playing around with your friends. You can get them from car accidents, from everyday activities. So having a little bit of knowledge about this isn't the worst thing ever. And then we'll talk about why um, they should matter in the context of the NCAA. So a concussion is an invisible brain injury. It happens basically when you go from moving quickly to stopping quickly. Your brain free floats inside of your head in this fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And so when you go from moving quickly to stopping quickly, the only way your brain can really do that as well is by hitting the inside of your skull. Not good news. Um, it bounces around. And if you think about your brain, I know when I first got into neuroscience, I thought the brain was probably pretty hard, kind of like a muscle. It's actually the consistency of jello. So if you think about jello hitting a bone, you can imagine that these brain cells are getting deformed, stretched, smushed, all kinds of things that probably aren't very good. And so as a result of those forces, your brain actually absorbs the forces. You can think of these brain cells, um, all the chemicals that are supposed to be inside of them, go outside of them, outside of them, go inside of them. It's a sort of a metabolic crisis in your brain. And it results in a whole lot of symptoms. Um, no concussion is created equally. So uh, if you think about the variety of symptoms that can happen, uh, headaches, nausea, vomiting, dizziness, confusion, difficulty remembering, difficulty concentrating, loss of consciousness, all kinds of things. Um, and that's because every brain's different, every hit's different, and every brain cell that's affected causes some different kind of symptom. Still stopping. Oh my gosh. So that's how a concussion happens. Um, in case you didn't get enough. I cringe every time. So how old do you guys think those kids are? Six, seven? That's what happens every day in the United States of America. Six or seven years old, running around like bobbleheads. They can barely hold their helmets up and doing a drill that doesn't teach you anything about football 
just about how to hit each other in the head. So concussions happen. Concussions are a problem, not just with little tykes, but also in the broader scheme of things, particularly in college sports. So there's a lot of different definitions of a concussion. Um, the underlying <coughs> themes here are complex injury, involves your brain, it's invisible, which is actually really important when we th come to think about um, things in the scheme of the NCAA. Um, basically caused from moving quickly to stopping quickly. That's what a concussion is. And there's a lot of them. So the CCC has these uh, estimates, 1.6 to 3.8. That's a pretty huge range. Um, and you can imagine why that's the range, because again, it's an invisible injury. Understanding when an invisible injury happens is inherently problematic. It relies on, unless you get somebody who's totally knocked out, you have to have somebody who understands what a concussion is, what the signs and symptoms are, and takes that knowledge and actually tells somebody about it in order for, some, for like a medical professional, a coach, an adult, if it's a kid, knows what's going on. So there's a lot of underreporting of concussions. And uh, that's in part why that range is so huge. But they're um, one of the most common injuries in kids and adolescents. They result in a lot of emergency room visits. They result in, therefore, a lot of dollar expenditures. And so if we think about this, not just in the context of the NCAA, but in the context of public health in general, concussions are a huge problem. So, I said one of the things that the NCAA does is make rules, rules like protective equipment rules. So let's come back and think about 1905, 1906, Teddy Roosevelt, the Ivy League presidents, they're sitting down and they're saying, okay, what can we do to make this thing safer? And they're like, okay, let's make them wear something on their head. Now at that time, the injuries that they were talking about were again, skull fractures, hematomas, big catastrophic death causing injuries. Putting something on your head to protect against those kinds of things makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I think this is another Harvard Archive picture. I really like this one. First face masks were a little bit different than what we see today. Um, but protecting your head, your orofacial structures against breaking of those bones is actually really important. But if we think about the mechanism of injury, how hematomas, skull fractures, brain bleeds are caused versus how concussions are caused, they're a little bit different. So these major injuries actually most often happen with high linear forces. So you get hit really hard with something coming straight at you. The concussions actually happen more often with high levels of rotational forces. So if you think of somebody getting blindsided, not seeing somebody coming from the side and kind of whiplashing around, that's actually more conducive to a concussion happening. Now that's not a one-to-one -one ratio. You can get hit straight on really hard and have a concussion. You can get hit from the side and probably have a major hematoma. But think about what a helmet does. A helmet is created to absorb force, linear force. And so it's not very effective at protecting against concussions. So they were really good and are still really good at making sure people don't die on the football field, right? We don't see, do you have a question? Okay. To what extent do helmets increase the actual rotational inertia of the head? So that's a great question. And there's actually a lot of um, questions surrounding the sort of use of helmet as a weapon almost at this point. Um, if you think about the rotational energy and how it most often occurs, it occurs when somebody's getting hit from the side. So the bigger the helmet, the more likely you are to get hit in a way that your head turns around. Um, additionally, the, the face mask in particular tends to stick out a little bit further, so that's one thing. Um, but there hasn't been a whole lot of research that's shown the increase because you can't do a you know, double-blinded study of people wearing helmets versus not wearing helmets while playing football today. You might get a little bit of gruff from your, your IRB. Um, but you can imagine how that would actually cause problems, not only just increasing the forces, but increasing the behaviors of dangerous activities. So it now doesn't hurt when I hit my head against somebody else. Well, maybe I'm gonna hit my head against somebody else now that it doesn't hurt, right? <coughs> Using it more as a weapon. Um, so that's a great question, actually. But basically these helmets created to avoid these major catastrophic injuries do a great job at that. But they definitely don't do a great job at protecting against concussions. Subconcussive blows is actually a term that's come into the literature much more recently. Um, when we think about football, for example, 
we see linemen every single play of every single game and every single practice lining up with their heads pointed at one another and hitting each other every time. You can think of other positions that hit each other a lot. You can think of these smaller hits that occur very routinely in other sports, hockey kind of checking, um, lacrosse bouncing each other around. So there are a lot of hits that happen that may not equal a concussion, but your brain's still getting jostled around. And so this term subconcussive blows has come into the literature to, to describe that type of hit. There's no immediate symptoms of a concussion, but you are getting hit. Now, the lineman example is actually really valuable here because there's been some helmet sensor studies, uh, accelerometers being put into football player helmets to help us measure how many of these hits actually happen. And in some of these studies, 1,000 to 1,500 hits per season happen at the force of 20 to 30 Gs, which is more or less equivalent to a car running into a brick wall at 35 miles an hour without any symptoms. So you can imagine that that happening 1,000 to 1,500 times might cause some problems, right? It's your brain we're talking about. So this cumulative nature of impacts, whether or not they're concussive in nature, um, has started to be examined much more readily. Now, this means that concussions are really only the tip of the iceberg, especially when we think about longer-term consequences down the line. So post-concussive syndrome is another sort of um, problem that can happen uh, after hits to the head. Um, this is a prolonged period of symptoms. You get hit, you have concussion symptoms, but they don't go away for a while. They last weeks, months, of unfortunately sometimes even years. They are still transient, they do go away, they're a part of that initial mechanism of injury. However, they just last longer. Now, we don't totally understand why some people have this prolonged nature of their symptoms. Um, most often it occurs when you don't allow a first concussive injury to rest prior to being hit again in the head. So you can imagine, again, being removed from play after a concussion is really important. Um, but eventually, this post-concussion syndrome will normalize. This is unlike chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the longest disease term known to man. Um, so CTE is what we call it, and it is a neurodegenerative disease. It was first reported in the literature in about 1928 uh, as punch drunk syndrome um, in boxers, right? So Harrison Martland, 1928, publishes this article in JAMA and he um, was a pathologist and he had studied uh, brains of boxers and other athletes and he found that nearly one half of the fighters who boxed, who played in the game long enough, had this neurodegenerative disease. This disease is kind of like Alzheimer's. Now, since that time, we did a literature review in 2009 and there was a total of 51 known cases of CT ever in the history of the world ever. Not a lot of people were looking. There's only a small number of boxers. It seems pretty obvious that people who try to knock each other out for a living might have brain problems. So since then, we've actually been studying the brains of athletes, football players, hockey players, soccer players, military veterans, victims of domestic abuse, people with headbanging behaviors from autism and other diseases. And just in those past four years, we've more than tripled the world's literature about this disease. Now, what have we learned in that time? What have we found? Um, by studying the brains of over 180 athletes and military veterans, this is part of our team, I should point out. So uh, Dr. Anne McKee has actually been leading the charge in this. This is her with Sanjay Gupta. Um, but we look at the brains both grossly, meaning without um, any microscopes or anything like that, but also under the microscope. And we have found that this is its own unique disease. So CTE, you don't even have to be a neuropathologist to look at the difference between the normal brain, right? There's like a lot of it there. <laughs> and then a CTE sort of mildly affected brain versus a CTE majorly affected brain. You can see that the ventricles right here are much more enlarged than they are. There's atrophy sort of all over the cortex. This one, I mean, pretty much everything has gone wrong in this brain, yes. Which white part? Like, there's sort of like, the cross section is like white and kind of like Right here? Yeah. So this is actually the corpus callosum. Um, it connects the two hemispheres of the brain. 
the, there's white matter and gray matter, I think it might be what you're talking about, the sort of outer ribbon versus the inner parts, and those are just two different um, parts of brain cells, effectively. Um, but in this context, it's not the hugest, um, it's not the differentiating factor, I guess. There's just overall atrophy is the point of this picture. Um, but when we look at the brains under the microscope, we see the real problem. We see that there's this aggregation of proteins that's causing the cells to not function well, to be abnormal. So the main protein that's implicated in this disease is called tau. And you see, everywhere you see brown is bad. So tau is this protein. It normally lives in your brain, helping stabilize the brain cells. And the idea is that if you get hit enough, some of that tau sort of shakes out, and then your body isn't able to clear it, and it starts clogging up your brain cells. It misfolds and it starts clumping up, not allowing your brain cells to function well. Now, when you also get hit, you see axonal loss. So an axon is part of a brain cell. It's the long part that allows it to communicate from one brain cell to the other. You also see that there is neuroinflammation. Your brain cells get inflamed. They don't like what's going on. They get angry. Again, it doesn't take a neuropathologist to see that there is a lot going wrong in this brain as it compares to this one. So again, everywhere you see brown is bad. Um, so you see brown in the depths of the sulci, which is at the bottom of this sort of cortical ribbon, the valley, if you will. You see it, and this is probably a stage three CT brain, a lot in the medial temporal lobe. It's all over, it's causing problems. And if you think about your brain, you need all of it to function well. Your brain does a lot of things for you. And so when you start having large regions of your brain rendered non-functional, you start to have real problems. Again, this is just to differentiate that CTE is a real thing. It's not Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is characterized by two proteins, tau, which is in CTE, and A-beta, which are these red clumps. Um, and so CTE, you see all the brown, none of the red. Alzheimer's, you see red and brown, basically. So in the past four years, we've studied enough brains to sort of come to understand what this looks like neuropathologically. We see that there are stages, sort of as you progress, your brain gets more tau and gets worse. So stage one, you just have a couple of little brown spots. This is um, generally earlier age folks, so the mean age here is 28. Stage two, there's more areas affected, again, mostly cortex at this point. Stage three, you start to see larger areas of involvement, including medial temporal lobes, and then stage four, you're got a lot of involvement in your brain and unfortunately a lot of symptoms. So what um, I'm gonna do is just tell you a little bit of a story about a person. I know this is not a, a class about brain slides, so I'm gonna tell you a story about a person. This is Owen Thomas. Um, he was a football player at Penn. He was actually um, unanimously um, voted to be the captain of the Penn football team the summer between his junior and senior year. He um, was a great guy. He'd been playing lineman since about age six or seven. Both of his parents were ministers. He had a great relationship with them. He was a straight A student. He was doing really great in his work. No complaints. His parents never knew of him ever having a concussion ever in his life. But again, let's think about those helmet sensor data. Let's think about what happens to linemen as they play football. They hit their head a thousand times a season from age six to 21. It's a lot of hits. And so, unfortunately, when Owen passed away, uh, his parents donated his brain because they thought it would be a control. They thought that he had no problems from playing football, um, that he'd never had a concussion. They wanted to help research. And they donated his brain, and this is actually what we found. Now, when you look at it at the beginning, you just see this couple of little brown spots, but he's 21 years old, and this is evidence of an Alzheimer's-like neurodegenerative disease. So this is pretty big stuff. And then obviously under the microscope you see the protein forming perivascularly right around those blood vessels. And you can imagine that this is the beginning of this process that we showed where there's a little bit of protein when you're younger, it progresses, it gets worse. It's not good news. College football player. Now, what are the symptoms? You see a lot of proteins in brain slides. What are the symptoms of this disease? What does it actually look like? What does a person act like when they have it? So um, in the paper we published earlier this year, we found that there are two sort of primary symptom tracts. One occurs uh, in younger folks, folks whose symptoms show up a little bit earlier. 
They begin with mood and behavior type symptoms. Um, impulsivity, aggression, short fuse, mood changes, depression, suicidal thoughts or behaviors. Um, oftentimes, if you have difficulty making decisions and impulse control, it leads to things like drug and alcohol abuse, um, nothing good. And then we have the sort of progression of the disease that shows up a little bit later in folks. It begins with more cognitive type symptoms, which is um, executive dysfunction, memory problems, difficulty concentrating, eventually progresses into a dementia. So don't hit your head. <laughs> Hitting your head's bad. Hitting your head over and over and over again only makes it worse. Um, it can result in concussions, which are short-term acute problems, <laughs> prolonged, acute, or prolonged but transient problems of post-concussion syndrome, long-term problems from chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Helmets are good, but they don't protect against concussions, and they don't protect against hitting your head a thousand times. That's the moral of the story. So before we go further, any questions about all of that science? I know this is not your typical class that you've had so far. Nothing? I explained it perfectly. Yeah, go. Have you guys been involved with the recent NFL litigation uh, concerning concussions? Involved is an interesting word. So I think one of the reasons why the litigation has come about is because of the research that we've done, because of the um, increasing understanding of the long-term effects of concussions, and because the former players feel like they didn't know about that and they should have known about that, that the NFL's NFL did know as their allegation and that the NFL should have told them as their employer about this job related risk. So I think are we involved not actually but in the background doing science in a way that informs people I think that it was part of the trajectory. Any other questions? Cricket, cricket? Okay. So I think Seinfeld actually says it best. I'm hoping the volume works on this. No. There are many things that I think you can point to as proof that the humans are not smart. But my personal favorite would have to be that we had to invent the helmet. What was happening apparently was that we were involved in a lot of activities that were cracking our heads. We chose not to avoid doing these activities, but instead to come up with some sort of device to help us continue enjoying our head cranking lifestyle. <laughs> the helmet. Even that didn't work because not enough people were wearing them, so we had to come up with the helmet law, which is even stupider. The idea behind the helmet law is to preserve a brain whose judgment is so poor, it does not even try to stop the cracking of the head it's in. <laughs> He says it the best, you can't beat Jerry Seinfeld. Um, so we've talked about why the NCAA was founded, what concussions are, why they should matter. There's a lot of college athletes who hit their head. This is why it should matter to the NCAA, whose founding mission was to protect the health and well-being of student athletes. Good. So what has the NCAA done so far to fulfill that mission, to protect its athletes as it relates to concussions? So in 2010, in April, the NCAA put forth a policy, which is great. Um, let's look at what the policy says. So the policy says that each institution, each school, needs to have a concussion management plan. Good so far. It says that each school should have a plan, and within that plan it should say that student athletes, which is a term the NCAA invented, student athletes should get educated about the signs and symptoms of concussion, which is good, and should have to uh, sign a waiver that says they understand that they've received this information and that they have a responsibility to report their symptoms to a medical professional. Not bad. That the student athletes who exhibit any signs or symptoms of concussion need to be removed from a practice or a game, should they, should they be observed to have those symptoms and that they need to be evaluated by a medical professional, good. That they can't go back into that game or practice for at least the remainder of that day, not bad. And that they need to be cleared by a medical professional, specifically a physician or physician's designee, prior to returning, 
These all seem like good things, right? So let's talk. Policies. We said educational materials, sign that you'll report your symptoms, need to be pulled from play, have to be cleared before you remove, have to be cleared by a doctor before you return to play, and can't go back within 24 hours. What do you guys think? Best policy ever? Could use some improvement? Could they be a little bit more specific about what it means to be educated about the signs and symptoms of a concussion? Could it be anything? What do you guys think? So they rely on the student recognizing that they have a Exactly. So they rely on the student who just had a brain injury to recognize that he or she has a concussion. That's correct. Anybody else see that that might be a little bit of a problem? Yeah. So like the 24 hour window probably isn't sufficient considering like what concussive symptoms can last out, right? 24 hours. It's not even 24 hours. The remainder of that day, yeah, probably not sufficient. Especially since they've also published research that shows that at least seven days is probably the minimum. Yeah, exactly. How are we educating the athletes? What does it mean to be educated, both in terms of delivery, who's providing that education, content of the education, what it actually says? Um, like this time off, can make an athlete not want to report the concussion or something? Exactly. So what do we do? We now have this rule that removes an athlete from play and has a specified period of time that they cannot return. That might be a disincentive for reporting. What can we do to counteract that? It doesn't talk about subconcussive blows at all, right? It doesn't say that athletes need to be educated about those. It doesn't say that they exist. Say it. So that is a good note. We'll get to that in a second. It says at the very bottom there that a violation shall be considered an institutional violation and shall not affect student athletes' eligibility per some constitution. We'll get to that in a second. It's a really good point. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, so the NCAA doesn't make a plan and give it to schools. It says all schools, each of you, need to interpret these rules and make your own plans based on your interpretation of these, we're coming to understand, pretty broad guidelines. That was really great, guys. These are basically all of the things that are arguably missing from the NCAA's concussion management policy. So that's what they've done, by the way. That, is, that statement is what they've done about concussion management at all NCAA member schools. So does that mean that the NCAA is institutionally corrupt? Let's walk through it. So you guys, I'm sure, have read this definition once or twice. Um, institutional corruption is the consequence of an influence with an economy of influence that illegitimately weakens the effectiveness of an institution, especially by weakening the public trust of the institution. So let's go step by step here. Influence within an economy of influence. What could possibly influence the NCAA or any member schools to not protect as best as they possibly can athletes against concussions? Well, there's <laughs> just a couple of <coughs> millions of reasons. Um, this was just pulled from ESPN, so it's, not, it's publicly available information. These are the <laughs> revenues actually in 2008 um, from just the top 25 uh, sports schools. And as you can see, the numbers are pretty big, $123 <coughs> million. That's a lot of reasons why, you know, that may hypothetically be influencing a school who the NCAA is putting the onus on to make these concussion policies, maybe not do them as well as absolutely possible. Limiting their own institutional liability. So after they created the rule, or right around when they were creating these rules, they were trying to come up with very nice language. Um, and this was a, an email that was, um, received by CBS Sports after the fact, and I think it's worth reading. So uh, this is an internal NCAA email. I'm concerned about this paragraph. An athlete who exhibits signs, symptoms, or behaviors consistent with the concussion, 
either at rest or exertion, should be immediately removed from practice or competition. It should not return to play until cleared by an appropriate healthcare professional. Their concern was, I thought we were trying to avoid this language in the rule books. Won't someone, i.e. officials, be liable, even if this language just appears in the appendix? So instead of prioritizing their institutional founding mission of protecting the health and well-being of student athletes, the concern here is liability. Again, this is not a, uh, the rules weren't created in a vacuum, right? So for the NCAA, this hands-off approach to concussion protocols is a calculated legal maneuver. The NCAA doesn't want to be seen as the, the entity responsible for taking care of student athletes. So if they put the onus on the member schools, if they say schools, you need to have a plan that includes A, B, C, and D, then they are removing themselves from that responsibility. They're sort of removing themselves from that uh, area of protecting student athletes. Any other outside influences that you think might be interjecting themselves into this concussion management process at NCAA, colleges, student athlete level? I know you guys can think of some. <coughs> no? Athletes like to win, coaches like to win, like to keep their jobs. Schools get people coming to their school because of major sports teams, right? Booster funds, there's a lot of reasons why these things actually happen. So we talked about influence. Illegitimately weakens the effectiveness of an institution. So when we're thinking about the efficacy of the NCAA, we're thinking about it here in the context of their founding mission, right? How well are they actually protecting student athletes in the context of concussions? So we decided to study this. We looked at this particular part of the NCAA rules, this educational aspect. So when you say your plan needs to include an annual process that ensures athletes are educated about the signs and symptoms of, con of concussion, how is that actually implemented? How do schools actually decide to interpret this rule and educate their athletes? So we did this in a pilot study of six hockey teams within one division of competition, and we just wanted to see, no intervention, we just wanted to see what was going on. Status quo, concussion education. We administered a survey one day before they received education, they got education, we were surveyed them on one day after, so three days long. And what we found was, unsurprisingly, the ways in which education was delivered varied a lot. The content of the education varied a lot. But what didn't vary, unfortunately, was that none of it was effective. Athletes did not change their intention to report concussion symptoms, signs, did not um, uh, change their concussion knowledge. Now, that could be because some of the ways that the concussion education was delivered included sending an email with a link that they hoped their kids read, or leaving a piece of paper in the locker room for common perusal, like one piece of paper for the whole team. <laughs> right? You can imagine that there, these are things that, that could be included in rules, like how you deliver the education, what the education includes, this was brought up, right? And this is, if the rules are big and broad and vague, if there's a general mandate, this is just one example, there can be a lot of interpretation. It can lead to a lot of variety of implementation. So, how else might this plan very, very, um, how might it just, not work? How might it not be effective? How might this not help the NCAA perform its mission? So what does the plan actually mandate? It mandates that schools have, or the, the policy mandates that schools have a concussion management plan on file. And that the plan includes some of these other things. So this is, again, within, within the NCAA, there's no enforcement no intention to enforce the policy. The legislation was specifically written for institutions to have a plan and describe what the minimum components of the plan are. There's no need for them to follow their plan. There's no checking to see what the plan actually involves, whether they actually have one. Now, what if they don't have one? 
This is what if there's no concussion management plan at an NCAA member school? What does this violation actually look like? I don't know if you guys can read this. Each institution has an affirmative obligation to monitor and control its athletics programs, to assure compliance with the, uh, the Constitution bylaws, has an affirmative obligation to report all instances of non-compliance. So if my school doesn't have a plan, I'm supposed to tell the NCAA about it. How many times do you guys think that's happened since 2010? Zero? Zero times? And you can imagine why, right? This is not the most effective enforcement mechanism especially considering there's no, um, I mean, there's, there's no need to provide the plan, but there's also no way for somebody outside of the institution to know whether somebody has a concussion management plan on file. Again, I'm belaboring the point, but it's worth it. As part of concussion uh, litigation brought forth by former athletes, Klossner, who was um, one of the head guys while these plans were created, testified at deposition that schools are not required to submit their concussion management plans to the NCAA. That's the, the NCAA is not monitoring whether schools have actually developed such plans, and that to his knowledge, the NCAA has not disciplined those schools that do not yet have a concussion management plan in place. So this sounds really effective. <laughs> no? I don't think so either, right? So they put out these rules, but these rules don't have any teeth. And without teeth, it's really hard for them to be effective in actually managing concussions within the collegiate sports environment. So I just wanted to see what that meant in the context of football. Um, I've been working on a study through my fellowship to see you know, how football players in particular um, understand concussions, their attitudes towards concussions, and whether or not these things are actually being diagnosed given the state of the rules. And these numbers don't look really big, right? I asked them, in the past two weeks, last season, and over the course of your career, how many times have you had a diagnosed concussion, had an undiagnosed concussion, had a ding, or gotten your bell rung? Those are the categories, right? These numbers don't look too huge. But when you look at it in context, the percentage of concussions that are going undiagnosed in the past two weeks, 2012 season, career, we have like between 80 and 98 percent of concussions going undiagnosed. It's probably a problem. Now, we also surveyed all of the uh, NCAA compliance coordinators, coaches, and sports medicine folks. We got over 900 of the 1,066 NCAA schools to participate. And what we found was there are schools without plans. They're not being reprimanded because there's no real way to, for the NCAA to reprimand them. They're not telling the NCAA about that. But there are NCAA schools three years later who don't have concussion, <coughs> four years later, who don't have concussion management plans. That's pretty crazy. So we've talked about influence. We've talked about efficacy. What about this public trust thing? So earlier this year, Linda Sanchez, I don't know if you guys know her, she's a congresswoman from California, she sent the NCAA a letter. And she wanted to know in particular, what are you doing to ensure that member schools have policies and they adhere to their policies? She wanted to know, has the NCAA, uh, sorry, I can't read this. Oh, <laughs> have they penalized schools who haven't followed their policies, basically? And what are they doing to inform their athletes about the long-term effects? Remember all those brain slides? The long-term effects of concussions and major traumatic brain injuries. She didn't get a reply. In response to the lawsuits that have been sued, uh, put forth against the NCAA, their main defense so far has been that they have no legal duty to protect college athletes despite this being at the core of their mission, the core of their founding mission. So you can imagine that statements like that might weaken the public trust in the NCAA. And all while not uh, you know, following or, or regulating concussion management, they have time to do things like regulate Snapchat as a recruitment tool. <laughs> or uh, 
you know, allow, they used to not allow spreads on their bagels because it was an undue form of uh, compensation. But now I think they've reinstated the bagel spreads. <laughs> so if those kind of acts don't weaken the public trust in an institution that's supposed to be protecting the health and well-being of athletes, I'm not sure what else would. Um, but we've gone through each of those categories, right? Influence, we've talked about efficacy, we've talked about trust. Does this mean that the NCAA is corrupt? Are there other forces, other things we need to consider? What's going on here? I, wanna, I want you guys to talk about this with me. I've talked at you a lot. What do you think? Is the NCAA a case study of institutional corruption? Not all at once. Pretty compelling case study, right? Not following their mission while simultaneously doing a lot of things outside of that. What else? Yeah. Where did the NCAA get its revenue? Is it directly from the school? That's a great question. So the NCAA, the primary source of revenue comes from television contracts, but they also have other sources of revenue. Um, there are membership fees, they're not tremendous. Um, but the primary source of revenue is from television contracts, which you can imagine might be influenced by allowing people, athletes, what they call student athletes, and I'm trying to avoid that term, um, is affected by whether or not those athletes keep playing, right, or if they keep getting pulled out of the game because of injuries, concussions or otherwise. What else? Institutional corruption? No? Yes. Let's take a vote. You can close your eyes if you don't want each other to know. Who thinks that the, this is a, a prime example, or at least an example, of institutional corruption on the ground, NCAA? Yeah? Anybody say no, I can't see everybody. If there was somebody who said, well, anybody want to tell me why? I mean, we had one good reason, go ahead. I would just, the only thing I'm not sure about is, when we're looking at institutional corruption, it's to do, because we're talking about why would this happen, why would there be an incentive to not protect athletes? Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the, the money involved in college football. Mm -hmm. So money motivates a lot of folks, but you can also imagine that the liability aspects, right? If, if the NCAA gets sued repeatedly, if it's not doing its job and it's getting sued repeatedly, I mean, the NCAA wants to continue to exist, right? It has a self-preservation motivation. And if that motivation, if they're, if they're unable to, to fulfill their duty of protecting student athletes while continuing to exist, they seem to be avoiding their main uh, aspect, main thing of protecting student athletes in order to limit their liability to not be sued so they don't have this whole area in which they can mess up even they're, though they're messing up anyway, but they're limiting their liability while simultaneously allowing their television contracts to continue to roll in. So I think that, I mean that's my impression, but I'm, there may be very many other opinions about this whole topic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ways for different people, depending on the type of hit. Do you think there are sort of like, like given that concussions sort of happen on a very case-by-case -case basis, mm -hmm. are there sort of like common sense broad picture things that the NCAA can impose like effectively that would like really make a difference across the board? Well, I think so. I think the things that we came up with when we were just looking at those rules, I'm not going to say that they can come up with a perfect plan that will protect every single student athlete, but I definitely think they can do way better, right? Sing what education means, both in terms of content delivery, frequency, what, you know, if, if you can tell if it's effective, maybe the kid has to take a test, heaven forbid, to make sure they know what happens to their brain when they get a concussion. Um, that's just one example. So I don't know that there will ever be a perfect plan for protecting every single brain, right? Every hit is different. And it does rely on the motivations of the athlete to come forth and tell somebody about it, which further complicates the picture because we have Athletes who want to play not to let down their teammates or their coaches, who want to continue on in their sporting careers, who don't think it's a really big deal. There's a lot of reasons why an athlete wouldn't come forth, but providing them with the information to know why they should come forth is like an easy first step. 
it's not going to be the only step, but also ensuring that the other stakeholders, so one of the other things that we're finding with some of our research is that um, the sports medicine personnel are feeling pressured by coaches and athletes to return athletes to play a lot more quickly than they feel is medically warranted, right? So making sure that medicine people can do their job, making sure athletes know what's going on, why a concussion is important, what the signs and symptoms are, what they need to do if they or their teammate has a concussion. I think those are easy first steps towards improving what currently exists. Yeah? Um, is there evidence to show that people don't <coughs> Is there, sorry, say that again? Oh, like, is there evidence to show that um, people play more safely and end up developing concussions after you give them information about the concussion? That's a great question. So there's a lot of research going on right now about mm -hmm. educational interventions for concussions, and particularly about um, utilizing some um, public health frameworks that have been used in things like smoking interventions, drunk driving, other big health problems that require people to stop doing something that they're already doing. and um, Right now, there's no perfect solution, but better than putting one pamphlet in the locker room for common perusal, for sure. And then also thinking about rule changes, right? We can say, the NCAA has the power to say, the Ivy League already has for its students, for its athletes, that you can only have X number of contact practices. Don't hit your head every single day. That sounds like an okay rule, right? You can do other things. You can lift weights, do cardio, get strong, do drills. Maybe just don't hit your head every day. That seems like a good first step. Yeah? So, so going back to your slide where you had the, all the teams and the um, diagnosed and undiagnosed mm -hmm. how did you get the data on the undiagnosed concussions? That's self-reported. That's athletes telling me they didn't tell about this many concussions. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're saying, this is what I think is a concussion, and this has been diagnosed for me X times, and this same thing has been undiagnosed. I've not come forth, or they haven't diagnosed me with it greater than X times, basically. What else? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, at this point, every state has approved um, laws that cover always high school and sometimes also middle school athletes, concussion-related um, laws. Mississippi goes into effect in July, but it's already been, it's been approved finally. They were the last standing state. Um, they get treated differentially across states as well. So the uh, laws, Washington was actually the first one they have some similar tenets to the concussion management policy of the NCAA. They say if a kid exhibits signs or symptoms, they need to be pulled, they need to get cleared by a doctor, and um, most often that the parent and or the athlete need to sign a piece of paper. So there aren't, uh, none of the laws have hard and fast rules of like X concussions and you're done. And that may not be the worst thing, right? Every concussion is different, like I said. Um, getting more of them is never going to be a good thing, but we also don't want to penalize people from coming forth so much that they don't, so it's always a fine balance. Um, I don't know if I've actually answered your question, but I think... Yeah, I'm just curious because I know how it was in my high school, but I was Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because, so, college athletes are fortunate in a lot of ways. They have sports medicine staff, like, on hand all the time. Most high school athletes don't. Right? Some, if you're fortunate and you go to like a well-off public school or a private school, it's not mandated that you have athletic training staff, except you know, for certain sporting events in certain states. But it's um, having medical professionals there because your coach is torn. Your coach is doing a million other things. So it is um, treated differentially at the high school level, definitely. They've changed some rules. They have. They eliminated the wedge. They um, have that targeting rule that everybody hated. Uh, so if you purposely hit somebody with your head, you can get called for targeting. It can be reviewed, but the penalty still stands. You just don't get thrown out of the game. They're probably going to change that up. They've been doing some things. Um, some things to try to avoid the big, blatant, obvious hits. Um, 
particularly in football. Football is the thing that everybody thinks about. They don't think about heading in women's soccer as much or you know, checking in hockey or hitting each other in lacrosse, which are also problems. And the NCAA barely regulates rugby, which is a whole other story. So <laughs> um, yeah, they've been doing some stuff. Is it like going to protect every brain? No, but it is a good first step. And I'm not trying to, like, the NCAA isn't the worst thing ever. I'm just portraying a case study here. They also, in January, brought forth, they put their first ever chief medical <coughs> officer in place. It's remarkable that it's their first ever chief medical officer considering their founding goal. But they have one now, which is good, <laughs> right? So they haven't done everything wrong. What I'm trying to portray is they also haven't done everything right. And there's definitely signs that they might have had ulterior motives along the way. Uh, it's interesting <coughs> Mm-hmm. Ever been in rugby? Um, have you presented the interesting case where you can have a study where people don't wear helmets, don't wear pads while playing mm -hmm. football? Rugby's probably the closest approximation. Is there a study as to? There, there are some studies that are going on right now in rugby and Aussie rules football too. Um, it's being looked at for sure. sure. It's interesting. It's the same idea. When hitting your head actually hurts, you don't have pain receptors on your brain like you do everywhere else. So like if you cover the outside of your head, it doesn't hurt the same way to hit your head as it does to hit anywhere else. So it's an interesting question as to you know, rugby, which was sort of primitive football before football got all of these rules, or you know, football with helmets. Um, what, what's the difference in terms of brain health that, or disaster? Do we have a rugby player over here? All of you guys? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rugby is not like an NCAA sport right now. Yeah. It's a rugby sport, so it's not regulated. Um, but we, as a team, like go through a lot of concussion protocol. And mm -hmm. This may not be a question to you, but I'm like wondering, does that come from the Ivy League? Is that sort of internal to Harvard? Because there are, there are places that it does seem like they are fairly, fairly... Yeah, no, Ivy League has been really proactive, which I think, I mean, is great. Uh, Ivy League has limited contact practices overall. They've, they've done a lot of things above and beyond. I think with the goal of having everybody else follow in suit, and there's been a little bit of following, but not as much as I think they initially um, wanted. I don't know if the rules are specific to Harvard or Ivy League. My guess is Ivy League, because I, they've been making a lot of rules for an increasing number of sports um, with regards to brain safety, which is tremendous. Um, so I was wondering, like, you were talking a lot about how the NCAA is like, mandating schools to do things. But given that concussions are a very different injury from most other injuries, and that they affect sort of like your whole lifestyle as a student as well as a student athlete specifically. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, do you think that the NCAA should be the institution with the burden to protect athletes as athletes? Or do you think that part of that responsibility should be on the institutions and like the academic? More there's, the yeah, academic there's definitely a lot of layers that. here. So when you get a concussion, your brain is out of commission, basically. It's not working as it should, which affects you not only as an athlete, but also as a student. You're in college, right? You guys are at Harvard College, which you need to use your brains on occasion, right? Um, so it's important to have that communication between the athletics aspect of, of a collegiate athlete, uh, athlete's life and the academics aspect, particularly because it's an invisible injury. If you walk in and tell certain professors that you have a concussion, they may be more receptive than other ones. Maybe you, some of you experienced that. But it's, uh, it is an important factor. And I do think that the schools have a role to play here. Um, but I also think that an organization founded on the principle of protecting athletes should probably you know, take its onus as well, not just put it all on the school. Uh, they know that there are problems, I guess. I don't know. I mean, I haven't personally spoken with the NCAA. I have, one of my collaborators is, um, does speak with them regularly. It's also a function of how their rule changes have to occur. So a lot of the rule changes have to occur by member school representatives all voting about it. So you have to have the Alabamas and the OSUs agreeing to the same things that the Harvards and the Princetons do, and that doesn't always happen. So it's not just a function of 
you know, some sort of single individual at the NCAA. It's also a function of buy-in. Um, so I, I play rugby, and I'm, I'm from Ireland, and rugby, like, we just don't, we don't mention concussion type of Yeah. I've never had sport of beer getting a concussion until I came to America. Yeah. And I remember there was recently a kid back home who died from a, in a game because of a double mm -hmm. Yeah, second impact syndrome, yeah, so probably. I think like, that's becoming a lot bigger. But um, my main question is around, well, rugby, but it's also sort of the football and other things like that. It's that athletes in general are getting so much bigger than when the games were first formed. So, like, the impacts are getting so much greater. Absolutely. That, like, has there been a much, like, has that increased the amount of concussions that you think? That's a good question. It's difficult, again, because it's an invisible injury. So, the reporting hasn't always been good. It's historically been much worse than it is today, and today still isn't good. So, it's hard to really know. But force equals mass times velocity, right? You get bigger and faster, you hit harder. It's science. So, I think that it's safe to say that, that that's not an unreasonable um, assumption, but we just don't have the data. Anything else? We good? So, Today, this is where we are. This is where football began. Um, I love Harvard, and I'm glad that I got to came back, come back today. Um, I also think Harvard brains are important brains, so keep yours safe. Go solve a world problem, <laughs> institutional corruption. And if you have any questions, <laughs> that's my information. Thanks, guys. If you have any final questions, feel free to talk to Christine. Uh, but uh, we're adjourned. Mal Salter from the Business School is here to introduce us to a three, um, three lecture, lecture sequence on economics. Uh, we're going to talk when Mal's here uh, about a, get a very bit broad picture of institutional corruption in the private sector. He's going to think about a lot of what are some structural issues that might make a variety of sorts of companies uh, not live up to their full sort of potential um, in, their, in the ethical domain, in their uh, public responsibilities. Um, the following week, Larry's going to talk to us particularly about the financial crisis and ratings agencies and some of the conflicts of interest that they had. And we're going to wrap up the final uh, lecture thinking about um, the larger economics profession, our intellectual understandings of the nature of economics um, and how various sorts of culture capture might in, in, be involved um, in misunderstanding uh, and mis uh, basically misconstruing the larger picture of uh, private sector regulation. So those re readings have all been laid out for the next uh, three sections. Note that it ch it's changed a little bit from the initial syllabus. We had Mal coming the second day. Now he's coming the first day. Um, but we'll see you on Thursday for Mal's uh, case study.